Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled, The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. Now, we've already studied a number of different so-called covenants, but we're beginning to understand that they all sort of fall into a similar pattern, don't they? And this particular lesson, which is number eight in our series, is entitled, Covenant Law, Covenant Law. It's the lesson for May 22 of 2021. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have been studying about what you want to offer us, what you uh, plan for us, what you plan for the children of Israel. And we can learn a lot from them and ways in which they didn't do so well. And we could do better, although I'm not sure we are doing any better. Guide us at this time in, in history to witness in such a way that we can bring this whole sin mess to a conclusion under the guidance of the Holy Spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What would our lives be like today if we followed God's directions in everything we did? Ever ask that yourself that? What does it mean to walk in the paths of righteousness? Why did God choose Israel? Well, there's a good question. Can that teach us anything about the Seventh-day Adventist Church in our day? Yes. Exactly what is the role of God's law today? What did Moses tell us about why God chose the children of Israel? He has some interesting things to say, Jim. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. The Lord did not love you and choose you because you outnumbered other peoples. You were the smallest nation on the earth, American Bible Society. Okay, so they clearly were not chosen because they were big and strong and powerful and numerous, right? Yeah. Jewish tradition, notice this, teaches that God chose Israel because all the other nations had rejected him first. Is there any evidence for that? Well, it's not based on the Bible. And it does not give us clear indications about how the other nations rejected God. So, Carrie? They, meaning the Hebrews, had no merit of their own that would make them worthy of God's love and his choice of them as his people. They were few in number, a group of enslaved tribes and politically and militarily weak. Plus, in terms of culture and religion, they were mixed, bland, and without much influence. The basic cause, then, for Israel's election lay in the mystery of God's love and grace. And that's from the Sabbath School Bible Study, study Guide, rather. <clears throat> okay. Now, it may be a mystery to us, but I tell you, uh, you can agree with me or you don't have to agree with me, I don't think God does anything without having a good reason. He knew what he was doing. So what might that reason be? Now, we, we may not be able to figure it out, but did it make any difference that they were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? That probably was a factor for sure, right? Then I want to ask another question, which I, I don't hear mentioned very often, but I think this is a really important point. What happened to the thousands of people who had been a part of Abraham's, quote, household? Abraham's household comprised more than a thousand souls. How many children did he have? One that became a part of the, 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 the chosen group, right? But how many were in his household? More than a thousand souls. Those who were led by his teachings to worship the one God found a home in his encampment. And here, as in a school, they received such instruction as would prepare them to be representatives of the true faith. Thus, a great responsibility rested upon him. He was training heads of families, and his methods of government would be carried out in the households over which they would preside. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 141. So, here's a question. Isn't it very likely that Isaac and Jacob had significant numbers of people connected to their households as well? Yeah. Sure, they must have. 
Did any of those people go into Egypt with the children of Israel? Possibly. Well, there's an interesting book, which uh, maybe I won't, won't mention it by name. I'm not sure that we should all be reading it. But anyway, someone tried to calculate based on the number of generations from the time they entered Egypt until the time they left Egypt. And if you count only the immediate descendants of Jacob and going down to Egypt and their family and so forth like this, they calculate in order to have as many people as they had by the time they left Egypt, each mother would have to give birth to 57 children. Not likely. Yeah. Not, in, in fact, impossible. So I personally very strongly believe that when the children of Israel went down into Egypt, it wasn't just their immediate family. I think there was a lot of these other people that went down into Egypt with them. They didn't count as their immediate descendants of Abraham, but they were considered a part of his, quote, household. Well, I think it's interesting if you look at the current Jews as we know them, they still quite a few of them believe that God is still their man, you know, yeah. the main leader. Yeah. Well, it is important to recognize that when we believe that God chose Israel for some reason, it does not mean that they are the only ones who will be saved and everyone else lost. Let's, let's, let's make that very clear. As we have suggested earlier, perhaps God chose Israel because he knew that they would demonstrate all the best and all the worst characteristics that befall humankind. So maybe they were just the examples for all of humanity. Did God have plans for the other nations even back in the days of ancient Israel? Jim? Isaiah 56, verse 7. I will bring you to Zion, my sacred hill, give you joy in my house of prayer, and accept the sacrifices you offer on my altar. My temple will be called a house of prayer for the people of all nations. How many people? Oh, yeah. people of all nations. We know that ancient Israel was supposed to be a, a, a shining light, revealing the truth about God to everyone around them. Unfortunately, we have to be honest, they failed in that goal. Do we as a church believe that we have been given a task like that as well? Yes. Are we saying something to the world that no one else is saying? Yes. Well, let me ask you, who else, besides Seventh-day Adventists and maybe only a select group of Adventists, understands and is talking about the great controversy between God and Satan over the character and government of God? And how many of us are? Not many. Yeah. It is certainly true that God has not chosen either ancient Israel or us to be some kind of exclusive club. God's plan has always been to offer salvation to who? Everybody. Everyone. So what percentage of Seventh-day Adventists are actively sharing the gospel today? Are we fulfilling the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, 14? I think we're getting better. I think so. Yes. Matthew 24, 14. In this gospel, uh, I'm sorry, in this good news about the kingdom will be preached to all the world for a witness to all nations and then... The end will come. So how many nations are we not preaching to? Well, that's a good question. What do we do in nations where there's, it's against the law to become a Seventh-day Adventist? We have radios that can get in there. We do. And uh, TV, too, for that matter. Yeah. There's a very interesting group of people, and I, don't, I assume they're still doing what they were doing, that have hot air balloons, small hot air balloons. Yeah. And with a little radio, little tiny radio transmitter in it. Yeah. And they launch them from the corner of the northwest, northeast corner of, of China. Yes. And they attach their whole bunch of Christian little pamphlets and so forth. And this thing flies up, they wait till the wind is blowing in the right direction, yes. launch it up into the air. It, this, it blows out over North Korea. And then when they give the push a button, that little radio responds and whoosh, yeah, drops all those leaflets. Yes, <laughs> I, just, I love that. Yes. We are very familiar with the story of Israel at Mount Sinai and the two, tablets of, two tables of stone on which were written the Ten Commandments. 
In ancient times, when someone, something was really important, they wrote it on stone so it would not be forgotten. Jim? Deuteronomy 4, verse 13. Moses said to the people, He told you what you must do to keep the covenant. He made you, he made excuse me, the, the covenant he made with you. You may, excuse me, you must obey the commandments which he wrote on two stone tablets. Okay. So what does God's covenant relation mean for us today? Does God's covenant involve any compliance on our part? What is the role of law in that relationship? I uh, work with a pretty good size uh, medical organization here connected with Loma Linda University. And we have a whole big compliance department. Yeah. And what is the work of the compliance department? Making sure everybody does it the way they're supposed to, right? Yeah. Does God have a compliance department? Well, I think people make the, make decisions based upon the information they've been educated with, mm -hmm. and uh, so people would would want that would don't want to live according to the God's recommended way, life. <laughs> they're not going to be there. Mm -hmm. It's not that he, God doesn't have to keep anybody out. People just don't want to go there. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's good evidence that when the final judgment comes, in effect, God just is going to draw a line, and all the people who are on his side will be his side, and all the people who don't want to be with him will be on the other side. God will just say, Whoosh. I've yeah. learned over the years that that word judgment, another nave word, is separation. Mm -hmm. It's a separation. Mm -hmm. uh, which ultimately individuals do, but uh, which is separation is the opposite of at one mm -hmm. Yeah. Think of that that way. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, if it wasn't for the Ten Commandments, that most the, the, the core of that is in most government's laws. Yeah. But more and more people want less and less of that kind of stuff, and we see it around us every day. Yeah. And, and, and they don't seem to realize that they're... Well, what, do, what are you talking Lighting the fuse themselves. Yeah. Uh, D Daniel 7.25, think to change times and laws. What are they doing now with, with uh, uh, gender? Yeah. Oh. Males uh, racing against females. Now, that, that, isn't that a... Uh, and, and you may have, according to the British broadcasting, you could have a hundred different uh, sexual identities. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's isn't that a, a, a law that, that is yeah. being perverted? Can you think of any kind of relationship that does not have some boundaries connected to it? A marriage? Yes. A business partnership? Even a friendship would be destroyed if one violated it by stepping outside the accepted norms and boundaries. Yeah. People are on television, and all of a sudden you find out that they're violating their marriage vows or something like this, and the whole, ooh, ha, ha, hoo, 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 you know, big... We've got an organization right here in the U.S. trying to get rid of Christianity. Oh, yeah. Quite openly. Yeah. Well, think about it. And I'm going to ask you out there to think about this yourselves. If you were responsible for setting up a brand new society, and you have to set up all the new rules and everything, which of the Ten Commandments would you think was unnecessary? None of them. And why? It's, well, it's, it, it, we call it a commandment, but it's really it's a prescription of, yeah. of the way to live, yeah. as well as it is a description or dis describing the way intelligent creatures will conduct themselves for eternity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And without coercion, extortion, duress, yeah. uh, pummel people, no people are going to be pummeled into submission. Yeah. Well, in the Bible, we find such words as law, statutes, testimonies, commandments, even the word of the Lord being used almost interchangeably. And there's a whole bunch of references. We won't read them right now. Psalm 78, 10, 50, verse 16, 25, verse 10, 103, verse 18, and Deuteronomy 33, 9. Think of some persons with whom, think of some person, an individual person with whom you have a very close relationship. Are there certain boundaries around that relationship which you would never consider violating? 
Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 13. Now, people of Israel, listen to what the Lord your God demands of you. Worship the Lord and do all that he commands. Love him, serve him with all your heart, and obey all his laws. I'm giving them to you today for your benefit. Your benefit. Our benefit. Is that really true? Well, what are your first thoughts when you think of law? Police officers, traffic tickets, judges, jail? Or do you think of restrictions, rules, authoritarian parents, punishment? Or perhaps do you think of order, harmony, stability, or maybe even love? The Hebrew word sometimes translated as law is Torah. That word, in, in its largest context, is the word used for the five books of Moses in the Bible. They're called the Torah. But in general, it means teaching or instruction. So, think about that. Are those five books of Moses good for teaching and instruction? Excellent, aren't they? I mean, you can, almost the full range of things that you can possibly think of are talked about there. Those books include all sorts of instructions, moral, civil, social, religious. How do you feel about the instructions given in the five books of Moses? Do, you, do some of them seem strange to you? Yeah, some of them don't seem completely kosher to us. Thou shalt not boil a kid in its mother's milk. I don't seem to, why would God say that? A reminder of the, what they used to do in the fertility That's cults, what the fertility it? cult people were doing, you're right. Or do we delight in God's Torah law? Why do you think God felt it was necessary to give them so much detailed guidance? Have you ever gotten buried in the book of Leviticus? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Jim, you want to take on? Deuteronomy 10, verse 13 and obey all his laws. I am giving them to you today for your benefit. Okay, for your benefit. God must know something that perhaps we don't immediately recognize, and that's that God's laws are for our good. Do you really regard all of God's requirements as a benefit to you? Did God expect too much of the Israelites? Did, did he really expect them to obey all his instructions? All the time. If you go through, the, if you translate that word "obey" as "listen," mm -hmm. and go through the Old Testament, it says, "You don't listen. You mm -hmm. don't listen. You don't listen." I will restore you. I'll heal you. Right. But the, his complaint is, "You don't listen." And, and we come across with the word "obey," but it's yeah. it's. Uh, so, even all the time, does he expect them? Is unquestioning and uncompromising obedience an unreasonable request? Or is it just good for us? Well, well, in the, the Garden of Eden. Yeah. You can eat of all the trees, but if you eat, eat of this one, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. It was good for them, wasn't it? If they yeah. would not have done so, they, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> it's for their benefit. Okay, so now let me bring that question a little bit closer down to our time. Seventh-day Adventists have been privileged to have Ellen White as our modern-day prophet. She has given us hundreds of thousands of pages of handwritten guidance from God. Do you consider the counsels of Ellen White equal in importance and validity with, to those instructions given by Moses to the children of Israel? Yes. There's a, there's a challenging question. There's a lot of people who would like to throw at least part of her out. And of course, as soon as you throw out part of her, what are you saying? You're saying your judgment is better than God's judgment. Well, how do you understand Romans 9, 31 and 32? Carrie? While God's people who were seeking a law that would put them right with God did not find it, and why not? Because they did not depend on faith, but on what they did. And so they stumbled over the stumbling stone. That's from the Good News Bible. So what does it mean to say to depend on faith in everything you do? In modern times, we, we tend to think of science as a way to discover truth. I mean, isn't that seem to be the, the idea of the world? 
In fact, science would not even be possible if the laws governing the universe were not consistent and unchanging. Yes. I mean, what if you did a big, long, expensive scientific experiment and you came to conclusion and then someone else does exactly the same exper exper experiment under the same conditions and the conclusion are completely different. You, you just be, you just, I mean, there would be no reason to even do science, right? Should we find that surprising? Well, who made those rules that govern science? Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord and I do not change. And so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not yet completely lost. James 1, 17, over the end of the New Testament, every good gift and every perfect present comes, down, uh, comes from heaven. It comes down from God, the creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change or cause darkness by turning. Good news Bible. When I read, the, every time I read that, in fact, I memorized all of the book of James one time when I was younger. Those are two very important texts. They are, yeah. I, um, I think of a story told about Abraham Lincoln when he was young. One day he skipped school, and you know how skinny he was. He skipped school, he wasn't there, and the teacher the next day said, Abe, where were you yesterday? Oh, he said, I was here. He said, no, you were not. Yeah, I just turned sideways and you couldn't see me. <laughs> <laughs> I think about that when it talks about God causing darkness by turning. Do those verses give you confidence in the trustworthiness of God? It can be demonstrated that without consistency and reliability, we cannot depend on anything. Science would be impossible and love would also be impossible. And they have a whole handout on our, on our website at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and if you download our handouts here, there's the, the key. If you just put that up on your computer, you'll, it'll, the, the handout will pop up. And what does it teach us? It teaches us that without consistency, without uh, reliable things like this, love would not be possible. Well, love would not be possible. Wow. So, Psalm 40, verse 8. Jim, I think that's yours. How I love to do your will, my God. I keep your teaching in my heart. The assurance that God is reliable and dependable lies in the truth that He is a God of law. His will and His law are one. God says that right, excuse me, that right is right because it describes the best possible relationships. Therefore, God's law is never arbitrary or subject to whim and fantasy. And fancy. It was the most stable thing in the universe. And it still is. Walter R. Beach, Dimensions of Salvation. Yeah. yeah. Very dependable. Yeah, absolutely. And we're so thankful. We should be anyway. Christians firmly believe that we are saved by faith. What is the relationship between faith and God's law? We always need to remember something we talked about a few weeks ago that faith is just a word we use to describe one's relationship with God as with a close friend. So how do you think about the Ten Commandments, for example? We believe that those first four commandments uh, talk about our relationship with God. The last six talk about our relationships with other human beings. Would you accept the statement that God has given us these particular laws for our own benefit? Yes. When you look around or consider listening to national, international news, what happens to people who break one or more of the Ten Commandments? Now, the, the four, we don't have laws requiring those, the four things about how to worship God and so forth. We think that's a person's private will, but you start breaking one or the other, the last six, and what happens? Society You're tanks. Trouble. You're off into trouble. Yeah. What do you think God is trying to tell us in the following verses? Genesis 18, 19, I have chosen him in order that he may command his sons and his descendants to obey me and to do what is right and just. 
If they do, I will do everything for him that I have promised. Carrie, would you be willing to take Genesis 26 there? Yes. I will give you as many descendants as there are stars in the sky, and I will give them all this territory. All the nations will ask me to bless them as I have blessed your descendants. I will bless you because Abraham obeyed me and kept all my laws and commands from the Good News Bible. Exodus 19.5 Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people. Leviticus 26.3 if you live according to my laws and obey my commands, it's from yeah. the Good News Bible, Exodus 19.5 makes it clear, quote, if ye will obey, the conditional aspect of the covenant is undeniable. Though bestowed by grace, though unearned, though a gift to them, the covenant promises were not unconditional. The people could reject the, reject the gift deny the grace and turn away from the promises. The covenant, as with salvation, never negates free will. The Lord does not force people into a saving relationship with him. He doesn't impose a covenant upon them. He freely offers it to everyone. Everyone is invited to accept it. When a person does accept it, obligations follow not as a means of earning the covenant blessing, but as an outward manifestation of having received the covenant blessings. Israel should obey, not in order to earn the promises, but so that the promises could be fulfilled in her. Her obedience was an expression of what it is like to be blessed by the Lord. Obedience does not earn the blessings, in that God is obligated to bring them, obedience instead creates an environment in which the blessing of faith can be made manifest. That's from the Sabbath School Study Guide. Yeah, for uh, Thursday, August, uh, May 20, I'm sorry. So, how do you look at the requirements of God? Do they seem in any way unreasonable? Do you enjoy obeying God? Do you feel guilty if you violate one of His commandments? Now, I know there's some young people who feel like that everybody else should obey the laws, but they, don't, they shouldn't have to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Deuteronomy 5, 33 says, Obey them all so that everything will go well with you and so that you will continue to live in the land that you're going to occupy. So that sounds like there's some conditions involved there, doesn't it? Would it be correct to say that God will take to heaven everyone who is safe to save? I know there's some people who feel very uncomfortable with that idea, but could God admit to heaven someone who's going to start the whole great controversy all over again? Yeah. I mean, what would be the point? Okay. So the people admitted to heaven will have to be safe to live next door to for eternity. Is that a fair statement? Well, they say that Paul has a list of things that are not going to be in heaven. Mm -hmm. And one of them is, is uh, liars and, and gossipers. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. And, and who is it uh, says, well, you can, you can let one gossip in. Yeah. That okay? was Provence said that. Okay. But it would be hell for them because nobody would listen. Yes, exactly. <laughs> As one reads through the five books of Moses, much is discussed about law and covenants. Was all that really necessary? Why did God feel it necessary to take them to the foot of Mount Sinai and perform that incredible epiphany on the top of the mountain? Now, here's a very, very heuristic statement that um, people should spend a lot of time thinking about and contemplating and, and so forth. Jim? If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham, there, there would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. Okay, let's stop there. So that's the first condition. Why was circumcision necessary? They didn't take they instruction for the law. Of they the weren't law. following God's law. Okay, go on. And if the descendants of Abraham had, had kept the covenant of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry, nor would they have been 
nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of, of bondage in Egypt. They would have kept God's law in mind, and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved, engraved upon tables of stone. Okay, let's interrupt there for a second. That's an incredible statement. There would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved upon the tables of stone. Really? What is she trying to say to us? Well, uh, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. They would have kept God's law in mind. Where's God's law supposed to be? In your mind. In our minds. If the law of God was in our minds and we serve God because we really believe it was the right thing to do, would it need to be written on tables of stone? Not at all. Does that, uh, does that mean even the Ten Commandments or is it just the, 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 the other laws that Moses gave them? No, it includes the Ten Commandments. Commandments yes. Absolutely. And there was a huge argument, those of you who are familiar with what happened in 1888 in the Adventist church in a place called Minneapolis. Uh, they missed this completely. Go ahead. And had the practi people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there had, would have been no need of the additional directions given to Moses. Ellen White, Patriarchs of the Prophets, page 364. Okay, so now if you read that, because this was, this passage fits with Galatians 3, where it talks about the law that was added. Okay, which law she's talking about here specifically? Really all of them, she said. Really? But she's saying particularly, the had the people Ten practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, and she's talking what had just been added because it was not in their Mind. minds. And how does it get into their mind is through the teachings of the Infinite One. Teaching, and, and it's education. It's an education process. That's the process of faith. When Jesus was asked about which is the greatest commandment, we have his response as recorded in Matthew 22, 34, and 34 to 40. Carrie? When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they came together, and one of them, a teacher of the law, tried to trap him with the question. Teacher, he asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. Okay, I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. Where, is that, where did he get that idea? The, you remember? The scrolls they had those days. Deuteronomy 6. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I've got to stop and pick it up again. 38 there. This is the greatest and the most important commandment. The second most important commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again. Where does that one come from? Leviticus 19.18, verbatim. Go ahead. The whole law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets depend on these two commandments. So the, the, the scribes and Pharisees were there and they were going to trap him. They're going to get him because he's not going to give the right answer here. He quotes straight from Moses. I mean, now the, Sadducees, the Pharisees accepted the entire Old Testament. The Sadducees accepted only the books of Moses. Both of these quotations are straight from the books of Moses. There was nothing they could say. They were just flat out, you know. At the middle of the corner. Okay. There must first be love in the heart before a person can, in the strength and by the grace of Christ, begin to observe the precepts of God's law. Obedience without love is as impossible as it is worthless. But where love is present, a person will automatically set out to order his life in harmony with the will of God as expressed in his commandments. And that's from the SDA Bible, Commentary, Volume 5, page 484. Okay, why would he say, why would anybody say obedience without love is as impossible as it is worthless? Why would they say that? Uh, if you obey 
What did we read last week? Remember? Oh, Obedience, say. which is not based on love and trust, produces the character of a rebel. Rebel. Is that is is when someone's a rebel, are they loving? Generally not. <laughs> I like that. Generally not. Okay. <laughs> That's a pretty good conclusion. In the precepts of his holy law, God has given a perfect rule of life, and he has declared that until the close of time, this law, unchanged in a single jot or tittle, is to maintain his claim upon human beings. Christ came to magnify the law and make it honorable. He showed that it is based upon the broad foundation of love to God and love to man, and that obedience to its precepts comprises the whole duty of man. In his own life, he gives, gave an example of obedience to the law of God. In the Sermon on the Mount, he showed how its requirements extend beyond the outward acts and, and take cognizance of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's from Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, 505. So what kind of people will find keeping God's laws easy? Well, we just read it. Yeah. Those who love, right? Yes. Oh. We're brought up that way. That helps. Why is it that love works better for law keeping than fear? Well, if it's fearful, people will do anything to avoid it or hide. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Well, the bond of love makes one want to obey, while to obey because you're afraid means that you would disobey if the opportunity presented itself. Review these passages that we studied last week. These are so important that I think we need to look at them again. Jim? The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he is required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. Okay, it, let's, let's interrupt for a second. We've got a few minutes here. That, that, that's an, an absolutely incredible statement. If you're doing it, if you're not doing it because you think it's the right thing to do, because you enjoy it, you're not obeying. That's a, you know. Well, what it is, if, if, there again, let's substitute the word uh, listen. Mm -hmm. You're not listening. Mm -hmm. and, and, and God, Jesus is the word. He uses words to communicate yep. his lessons. And if you don't want it, he can't force it on you. Yeah. So what does it say about such a person? He does not obey. Yeah. When the requirements of God are counted a burden because they cut across human incl inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will be lead to do, excuse me, this will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. Christ's Object Lessons, page 97 and 98. Okay, well, I'm going to interrupt there again. How would we develop that kind of a relationship with God? How would we come to see the example of Jesus, for example, um, as something we really wanted to do, we really wanted to be like him. You would have to watch it. You would have to observe it. You would have to see what the consequences were. And what would you decide? The, Satan, has, Satan has maintained down through history that if anybody who was really free would choose his side. So he would say, only people who are forced are on God's side. Well, think, uh, think of the story of Job. You yeah. don't have to be too much of a student of human nature to see what happens if you don't live it according to yeah. these principles and what happens. Yeah. Uh, it, it, there's an awful lot of collateral damage that <laughs> good yeah. people suffer. Look at Jesus. Yeah, exactly. So. The only way for us to really learn to do right because it is right is to say, look at the life of Jesus. 
is that the way you want to live? If it's not the way you want to live, you choose to vote, vote against God, then you know what the consequences are. You're on Satan's side. Yeah. If you look at the life of Jesus and you say, it may not be easy, my human nature might say, well, I don't really want to do this. But if you look at it long enough and you begin to understand the implications and you say, I want to be like him, then you'll do it because yeah. you like to do it. Yes. it. It seems right to you. Well, and it, it gets to the point where you can know the Father and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's what eternal life is, John seventeen three. And if you look at Desire of Ages, page 668, there is a place there where it says, if those who follow the example of Jesus and really are committed to it, eventually it would be, you know, it just comes naturally yeah. to do what's right. Okay, Jim. How does that go? Uh, and those who do what's right because of, uh, it's right, not because of a promise of a reward or a threat of punishment. Yeah. I like that. Uh, yeah. I, okay, the other half of that story. A sullen submission to the will of the Father will develop a character of a rebel. By such a one, service is looked upon as drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully and in the love of God. It is mere mechanical per performance. If he dared, such a one would disobey. His rebellion is smothered, ready to break out at any time in bitter murmurings and complaints. Such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, July 22, 1897. How many people in heaven are you expecting to find there complaining about the food, complaining about the company, complaining about, there's not gonna be there. I mean, no room for belly acres. <laughs> no, no room for belly acres. I mean, just think of it. It would be, it would be completely inconsistent. Yes. To, 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 I mean, God's not trying to be difficult. He's just saying, the rest of us want to be, want some yeah. peace, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, and of course, we told you that the key sentence there, right in the middle, is left out in some places where they have copied that quotation. It's unbelievable that it would do such a thing. That's a problem with some of the paraphrases that, that yeah. were, and the Bible has the same situation yeah. many yeah. times. We have been discussing God's relationship with the Hebrew people, but it is very clear even in the Old Testament that God intended to reach out to all other nations as well. And how were they supposed, how, was he want, how did God want to reach out to them? Carrie? Yahweh has always been in contact with non-Hebrews and chose to make heathens his representatives and agents, even priests according to his will. Yahweh uses Jethro the Kenite, who was familiar with the name Yahweh before Moses. And okay, in let's, let me interrupt there for a second. I'm sorry. What do we know about Jethro? Moses' father-in-law. Moses' father-in-law. Okay. It was his daughter that married Moses. Okay. Go ahead. And in fact, helped him to understand it to facilitate his plans and purposes for humankind. Here we have a so-called heathen, Afro-Asiatic people preserving this vital intelligence before the Hebrews came on the scene. That's from Charles E. Bradford's Sabbath Roots, The African Connection. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's get into this a little depth, a little more in depth, just to try to firm up what we've learned. The Hebrew word Torah, the Hebrew law, Torah, appears in the Old Testament no less than 220 times. It must be taken to mean law, it must not be taken to, be, to mean law, in the Latin sense of lex, meaning law of the empire, in other words, this is what was passed by Congress, or this is what was passed by the government, or this is what the king says, you know, you have to do it. Not that kind of law. Nor is it to be understood as the Greeks understood their word for law, nomos, namely that which has always been, been done. So they said if that's the way it's always been done, that should be the standard. Okay? Uh, in the Hebrew language, the, the, name, the term terra, Torah comes from the Hebrew hora, meaning to point out, to teach, or to instruct. Accordingly, the, the noun Torah means in its broadest sense, teaching or instruction. 
In this sense, the word law signifies all the revealed will of God or any part of it. And once again, let's just remind ourselves, in the Hebrew Bible, what section is called the Torah? First, the first four, five. five books of Moses. The first five books of Moses. I mean, the, the five books of Moses, the first part of the Bible. Thus it is evident that the way of salvation in the Old Testament and the way of salvation in the New Testament are the same, both being salvation by grace through faith, which results in obedience. Now, you might not immediately come to that conclusion if you hadn't done a little bit of study, but that's true. Have you ever suffered from breaking God's law? How much better would our world be if everyone obeyed God's law? Much better. Even just the last six commandments. I mean, think how better the world would be if we just, if everybody obeyed. And what are we doing? And in, in courthouses where there, where there people have had the Ten Commandments up and the Bible Belt in the South, got to take them down. Yes. Wow. A careful evaluation of the things we have been talking about will demonstrate that God's plan of salvation was just the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. Uh, you cannot have a thought without Christ. How's that for a thought? <laughs> yeah. You cannot have a thought without Christ. You cannot have an inclination to come to him unless he sets in motion influences and impresses his spirit upon the human mind. Ellen White, Faith of Works, 73, paragraph 1. So, I mean, are we willing to admit that every thought process, everything that happens between our ears is designed by God? Yeah. Is his plan, is, is that's the place where we have a chance to, I mean, our picture of God, where does our picture of God come from? It comes from all the information we've put in there. We've sort of tried to jumble it together and, and come up with a conclusion. So you're not, we're not worshiping the real God. I mean, let's be honest. What we're worshiping is a picture of God that we have put together in our minds, right? And that's why it, you need education. Yeah, yes. exactly. And I think what Ellen White in the book Education says, education is redemption or redemption is education. Yeah, yeah. William Barclay said that to be truly religious is to love God and to love the ones whom God made in his own image. Yeah. They may not act like they're in God's own image sometimes, but we're still supposed to love them, right? This love is not some, and notice these words, not some vague, nebulous sentimentality, but a full commitment to God that issues forth from the heart and practical service toward our fellow fellow humans. You could add, love is a principle mm -hmm. rather than just a warm emotional It's not a sentiment. Feeling. No, it's not a yeah. sentiment. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a principle, which means that you do what is right because it is right. Yeah. And right is, is love, the loving thing to do. Right is the kind, Christian, nice thing to do for, for everyone. Yeah. Okay? As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we sometimes suggest that our challenge is to follow the example of Jesus every day. Can you think of some examples from the life of Jesus that demonstrated his incredible love for those around him? I decided to take a little while and look through the book Desire of Ages. And I said, let's not just write, go out there to the end where he's in conflict with the scribes and Pharisees and that kind of stuff. Let's go back to the early part of his life. What can we learn about how Jesus behaved when he was young? Remember that Jesus lived under incredibly difficult circumstances. Where did he live as a young person? Nazareth. And what was it, how was Nazareth known? Not a good place to be. <laughs> Not a good place. Why would God put him there? Well, it was a good way, place to help him develop the character. Okay, and... Uh, the, the other side of that coin is no one can say that Jesus, well, Jesus, the reason Jesus was good is because he, he was pampered and he was yep. petted and he was, no, not in Nazareth. He had, so, to be, he had to be brought up just like any other kids. Yeah. Well, look at these incredible statements. Satan was unworried in his efforts to overcome the child of Nazareth. 
Now, of course, think about this. Did Satan figure out who this child was? I mean, he heard the angel probably speaking to Joseph and speaking to Mary. Yes. He knew who this child was. Yeah. Okay, he knew that Mary didn't get pregnant because of an, 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 a meeting of with Joseph. This child was the son of God. So, what would Satan want to do more than anything else? Get rid of him. Get rid of him. <clears throat> that there should be upon the earth one life free from the defilement of evil was an offense and perplexity to the prince of darkness. He left no means untried to ensnare Jesus. I mean, imagine growing up. I mean, we have enough problems growing up under our circumstances. Imagine having the entire host of, of Satan and his evil angels trying to get you to sin. Yeah. No child of humanity will ever be called to live a holy life amid so fierce a conflict with temptation as was our Savior. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 71. Tim, would you like to take that next one? Christ was the only sinless one who ever dwelt on earth. Yet for nearly 30 years he lived among the wicked inhabitants of Nazareth. This fact is a rebuke to those who think themselves dependent upon place, fortune, or prosperity in order to live a blameless life. Temptation, poverty, adversity is the very discipline needed to develop purity and firmness. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 72. Jesus worked to relieve every case of suffering that he saw. Okay, now we're talking about following the example of Jesus, okay? What did Jesus do? Read that sentence again. Jesus worked to relieve every case of suffering that he saw. Wow. He had little money to give, but he often denied himself of food in order to relieve those who appeared more needy than he. His brothers felt that his influence went far to counter excuse me, went far to counteract theirs. He possessed a tact which no one, none of them had or desired to have. When they spoke harshly to poor, degraded beings, Jesus sought out these very ones and spoke to them words of encouragement. Man, just imagine that. Here's, you know, he has, <clears throat> how many brothers did Jesus have? I mean, these were, these were stepbrothers. Yeah. We know about four, don't we? Yeah. And we know that he had sisters, which means the Bible says sisters, plural, so there were at least two. If the law of averages played out. He might have had four sisters and four brothers. He could have had any. He could have had even more sisters. We don't even know who they were. Yeah. But Jesus, every time he would see his brothers mistreating someone else, what would he do? Yeah, try to straighten things. Find out. that person and treat them nicely. Yeah. Wow. Okay. The, the Just thing, the opposite of what the apocryphal gospels say yeah. in that book. <laughs> yep. The thing that always stays in my mind is when they went to the Passover and started to go home and Christ was still back in yeah. Jerusalem talking with the leaders. There's not many 12-year-olds could do that. Boy. Not yeah. even today. Go ahead. To those who are in need? To those who were in need, he would give a cup of cold water and would quietly place his own meal in their hands. As he relieved their sufferings, the truths he taught were associated with his acts of mercy and were thus riveted in the memory. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 87. Jesus was the healer of the body as well as of the soul. He was interested in every phase of suffering that came under his notice, and to every sufferer he brought relief, his kind words having a soothing balm. None could say that he had worked a miracle. Let me, let me interrupt there for just a second. Um, some of you are familiar with um, the, some of the apocryphal stories about Jesus. There's a story in one of the apocryphal, this is not, not true gospel, this is stories that people made up about Jesus, that one Sabbath he was down by the river, the stream there in, 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 in Nazareth, playing in the mud beside the river. And he was forming little birds uh -huh. out of this mud. And when the people came along and said, Oh, what are you doing playing in the mud on Sabbath? Jesus clapped his hands 
and the little birds came to life and flew away. <laughs> well, this, you know, they, 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 she, Ellen Y is just saying, this, this was, there were no miracles. This was none of that kind of nonsense. I'm sorry, go ahead. Where was that? His words were heavy to soothing balm. He could say, excuse me, none could say that he had worked a miracle, but virtue, but virtue, the healing power of love went out from him to the sick and distressed. Thus, in an, un, uh, an unobtrusive way, he worked for the people from his very childhood. This was why, after his public ministry began, he, so many heard him gladly. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 92. So, there are some examples of how Jesus behaved even when he was young. I'm talking about young. In Wicked Nazareth. I, I never heard that story. I mean, even though it's a Desire of Ages, you know, as you read some of yeah, that, you, you just you forget, miss some of those things. You forget those things, yeah. <clears throat> Why did God think it was necessary to give so many detailed instructions to Moses coming back to our main theme? If we set as our goal to follow the example of Jesus, would we need all those detailed instructions? Are they supposed to be for our benefit? Yeah. Or for God's? Or both? Well, back to John 17. Eternal life is to know. And that's what you, we do is we learn, learn these stories about Jesus. Does anything we do on this earth impact God in any way? Carrie? I'm using 1 Corinthians here, chapter 4, verse 9. For it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle for the whole world of angels and of humanity. I'm from the Good News Bible. We are a spectacle to the universe. In light of what are we studying in this lesson, do you think it is possible to obey God's laws and to be a part of this group that will finally carry the gospel to the entire world. Yeah. You remember Matthew 24, 14? Do you find that those around you consider the Ten Commandments firm and fixed, having been written on stone? Or are they like some have suggested, just ten suggestions? How is your relationship with God impacted by God's law? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for this privilege we have of studying your word, of thinking about your law, of thinking about your, your promised covenant with us. Help us to realize what an enormous privilege it is for us to enter in that, into that kind of relationship with you. May that be our experience from this day forward is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.